Can terrorism in Europe be defeated? It's a heck of a question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But if we don't think it can, we could all go home. With that sobering thought, let's open this discussion. As we know, terrorism asymmetric threats have risen mm. right up the agenda in Europe. Um, though, let's remind ourselves, attacks on civilians have been even more devastating, certainly in quantity, perhaps even in quality elsewhere in the world. And of course, terrorism in our mind, particularly when we look at it in the European context, is coupled almost inevitably to other major preoccupations in the continental area, the neighborhood of Europe and beyond, with phenomena such as the migration and movement of peoples and the growth on a global scale of criminality. We've witnessed devastating attacks on groups in Europe over the past two years or so for maximum publicity and effect. I just merely mentioned a few. Charlie Hebdo, Bataclan, Stade de France, Nice, Molenbeek, Zaventem. But also, which will be going through our discussion, there are the unexpected attacks by rogue individuals who seem to come from nowhere. Three in the space of little over a month in Germany just this summer. And another element that will colour our discussion is the proselytisation by social and alternative media and the flow to and from the battlefield of jihad in the Levant, Syria and Iraq. So how can this be challenged and <clears throat> confronted to give us some idea of the scope of the problem, as well as specific areas worthy of attention and action, we have four expert speakers. Uh, each will talk about a specific area of policy, analysis, and action. They are, on my far right, but not um, uh, a much <laughs> abused word in the public media these days. Everything is of the far right or of the far left. But uh, Lord Ashdown, former politician, soldier, and high representative uh, in the Balkans. And then we have Lily Camprani, who is Deputy Executive Director for UNICEF UK. That's have I got it right? You've got it right. Right, thank you. Next to, uh, uh, on the near left, that's a new one for us, isn't it? It's Dr. Pippa Mal Malmgren, founder of the DRPM Group, and your advisor to the, have been, or continuing advisor to government, the MOD uh, in the UK. And finally, an old friend, extremely distinguished, General Sir Richard Shireff, former uh, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe, now partner in Strategia Worldwide, and Supreme Novelist. Uh, more about that later. Each will speak for about five mm. minutes uh, 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 on their subject, and we will have uh, a brief discussion among ourselves, among the four speakers, and then I will throw uh, the matter open to the floor, giving the speakers uh, mm. an opportunity to summarise at the end. Can I ask you to start us off, uh, Paddy, please? My text is taken from two unlikely bedfellows, Karl Marx and Corporal Jones of Dad's Army. <laughs> um, Karl Marx said, um, those who forget history are condemned to repeat it, and we need to remember our history of this, and Corporal Jones said, don't panic, <sighs> and that's my message, don't panic, don't panic. We've been through this before, and I want to try and explain to you how. First of all, it is the habit of all governments and the enthusiasm of dictatorships to frighten the people to death in order the better to persuade them to relinquish their freedoms and give government more power. I don't say it's a bad thing, but it always happens. It's always the instincts of government. And secondly, it is not new. It has been repeated so many times in history that you can persuade young men, mostly young men, to believe that it is a good thing to kill others, sometimes in great quantity, in pursuit of some what they regard to be noble ideal. It's happened right the way from the times of the Hashashin, back in, um, in uh, the time of the Romans, right the way through to the Bader Meinhof, to Rote Army Faction, to the IRA. Perhaps the best analysis of the times we are living in through are 
the anarchists of the latter part of the 19th century. Let's just test your history. Anybody studied the anarchists of the last, latter part of the 19th century? Robert, obviously. Not one of you. You're all supposed to be experts in terrorism. Let me remind you that they were a group of terrorists. If you want to have a good read, read uh, Joseph Conrad's Secret Agent. Let me remind you that they were homegrown. They were lone wolves. They did not have a command structure. They were inspired by texts, radical texts in their case, which they regarded with semi-religious enthusiasm. They operated um, completely across borders and internationally. They proposed a borderless utopia without governments except those run by the anarchist doctrine. They were suicide bombers, one of them throwing a bomb into a Paris cafe in 1880-something or other, said, we who hand out death know how to take it. So in all of those circumstances, they are very similar to what we're experiencing. And in case you think there was some sort of interesting little side effect that didn't have any effect on governments or mount any major terrorist attacks, I'm just amazed that none of you in this room have even looked at this. Were they successful? Well, have a look and see who they killed. They killed a US president. They killed a Russian czar. They killed the Empress of Austria. They killed the president of France. They killed the king of Spain and the king of Italy. They killed the heir to the Austrian throne. And they killed numerous, numerous, numberless European ministers, mostly ministers of the interior. They threw a bomb into the Barcelona Opera House and killed 72 in the process. They threw another bomb and blew up the French Chamber of Deputies, killing 19 and injuring hundreds. They threw several bombs into Paris cafes. Completely innocent people were slaughtered by the tens and sometimes by the twenties. They, had, they initiated five simultaneous bomb attacks across the United States. They threw a bomb in, they let off a bomb in Wall Street, very close to the Twin Towers, killing 19 and injuring hundreds. And in all of those occasions, the response of the security services was, give us more power, give us more power. Of course it was. I mean, I'm not criticizing them. This is perfectly normal. If your security service is charged with keeping the people safe, of course you want more power in case there's a bomb outrage on your, on your watch. And by the way, ditto for governments. Of course they want more power too. Home secretaries want more power. Because what happens if a bomb goes off in London and you're the home secretary? But it is the job of politicians democratic politicians to be jealous about giving away the human, about the, the citizens' rights which they are elected to protect. So we will tackle this. We should not believe that he's never been here before. We have. The main thing is to take sensible, judicious, patient measures, in particular, not necessarily with brute force, but to change the habit and thinking because that's, uh, that's where they draw their support. Our work, it seems to me, is much more better directed in helping our fellow Muslims win back control of their own religion uh, for its decent and proper values than by bombing them into submission in the deserts of the Middle East or indeed in, by removing their civil liberties in our own country. That is the way to tackle this, not by pretending that this is some unique new phenomenon the world has never faced before, but looking at it within its historical context. It's a challenge which we can rise to, and it's not difficult, it's difficult, but does not require, it requires a degree of wisdom, but it's not impossible to do it. Thank you very much. Um, I'll come back to you when we join in, but it was very interesting points about uh, uh, particularly how you get that message across and through whom. I'd like to call next on Lily Camprani, um, mm. and you have um, some views on very specific measures or, or procedures in specific areas. So, yeah, I should say at the beginning, maybe you're wondering what someone from UNICEF doing on this panel. UNICEF is a children's agency, it's not a security organisation, and perhaps we're not experts in security or terror, but what we are experts in is working with children, young people, individuals and communities around the whole world to build the kinds of educated, peaceful, inclusive, just communities and societies in which young people grow up feeling they have a stake in the community they live in and every reason to want to contribute to it and preserve it and not to destroy or attack it. 
And in that sense, we have a huge number of learnings from working with children who become child soldiers, who are recruited to militias, often boys, but girls recruited to be sex slaves to terror and militia groups, for example. And the process of grooming, radicalization, recruitment, coercion sometimes, but not always, is something that we can see that we have in common in many parts of the world. So our concern is that wherever possible, you ought to be thinking about broad strategic policies that can prevent the kinds of enabling environments that produce a greater likelihood of young people being radicalized. And it's going to be very hard for me to talk about that without sounding like a bleeding heart liberal, um, despite being on the center right of this panel. <laughs> um, but I will make no apology for it, because I think we do have to think in the really long term about building the kinds of societies, not where there's no, no risk at all of terror, but where we reduce the risk as, as much as possible and think broadly about countering extremism in all its forms. And to, you know, to state the absolute obvious, no baby is born a terrorist, no five-year-old has some innate desire to harm others, and really no ten-year-old is driven by some natural uh, instinct that it wants to terrorise, attack, maim or kill. A process, and I think Paddy called it, of persuasion takes place. And we see that process changing in some ways over time because of a connected global world, connected global internet communications, but we also see some things that don't change, and that's a certain kind of vulnerability, alienation, lack of integration that creates the conditions where young people are more likely to be radicalized. And so I want to say that we want to create communities where are we ever going to find a time when no adult ever wants to exploit young people? Sadly, probably no. We see it every day. Are we able to create the kinds of systems and communities that can protect children from that? Yes. So my main first message is that radicalization and counter-extremism is a child protection issue. It's about safeguarding, just as it is when we see children in Uganda being recruited to armies and being brutalized and turned into weapons of war. The same can be said of young people in the UK or anywhere around Europe. On the other hand, I think we're challenged by this idea that somehow these are vulnerable, poor, marginalized children, because what we've actually seen in the last few years is very worldly, university-educated, quite westernized, homegrown terror. And it challenges some of our perceptions, and we need to better understand why these young people felt so disaffected and so alienated from their own quite free and opportunity-filled societies, or at least we see it that way. So asking questions about why those people who maybe have an affinity with others they perceive to be like them in other parts of the world who are experiencing oppression or discrimination. In the case of Islamic terror and extremism, young people in the United Kingdom who see others around the world experiencing things that they relate to because they live in an interconnected global world where their brothers and sisters are not necessarily the people in their streets. We need to think about that. And at the same time, we need to think about... Uh, you probably know the UN doesn't have a single definition of terror, and academics can't agree, and they probably never will. I've always been... I was very lucky to have um, Professor Connor Geerty at the London School of Economics teach me um, on a master's degree, and he, well, it was struck me that he always talks about terror as being about communication. Mm. Um, terrorists aren't just seeking to harm others, but to send a message and they have a whole new way of doing that now. So some things don't change, and I agree with Paddy that there is lessons from history, but the means of communicating a message have changed. And I think we need to think about how we change the way we listen and understand that message in the same way um, as they are weaponizing the internet. We need to think about the internet as a, as a tool for prevention as well. Thank you very much, because I'm mm -hmm. sure interlocutors and how we get through the gates that go into media and social media is again a subject that we should uh, f flag up and probably talk about in our discussion. Next, uh, Pippa, um, you also have specifics that really need to be addressed to deal with or confront the phenomena 
of asymmetric attack, subversion, terror, uh, by virtual means and kinetic means. So it's become almost politically incorrect to suggest that economics has any part to play in any of this. Uh, and it's certainly true that it's not that poverty drives terrorism. But I do think that business models do. And we need to think very hard about the economic conditions that create an environment in which money is generated by being affiliated with terrorist groups. Uh, I learned <coughs> from my own personal experience when I worked in the White House for the president, uh, I had the subject of terrorism risk to the economy after 9-11. And it was fascinating to realize uh, that many terrorist organizations do operate almost like a real business. They have divisions, they have cash flow streams, they are not all related to things like illegal drug trafficking. Quite often they're involved in the counterfeiting of luxury goods. Uh, it was extraordinary to realize that at the end of the day, when you have, for example, an organization like ISIS, what is the value of being able to expropriate the assets of the citizens in the community that you now control? The answer is it's very valuable. It's extremely valuable. So I think that in the realm of defense and security, quite often we don't really address economics. That's considered somebody else's remit. But in fact, they're so deeply integrated, we can't actually separate them. So my thought on this subject is we really need to think about the economic drivers. So I'll give you a few examples that I think are relevant. They don't necessarily contain the answer, but they tell us a little bit about the drivers. So for example, I don't think it was any coincidence that uh, two years ago when the Greeks found that they were in such financial distress from their economic condition that they were unable to pay the guards looking after the uh, illegal immigrant detention centers. And so they simply announced, we can't pay the guards anymore, so we're going to throw open the doors and all the illegal immigrants shall be released. And good luck to them. Well, how long do we think it takes for everybody to register? There's basically been a hole punched in the border of Western Europe by financial distress. And it plays an equal part to a fence coming down to say that suddenly there's a, there's a hole in that border. Uh, and then what is the business opportunity to begin trafficking through that border? I would say it's immense and underestimated in our analysis of terrorism. Uh, I also think that in my conversations with people who are actually in the political world, in the parts of the Middle East that are spurring much of this, they will walk you through it and say, you know, at the end of the day, there is serious money to be made. You have almost like an investment banking model when it comes to ISIS. You get to keep what you kill, whatever monies mainly come to you first. Uh, it's also a philosophical approach, which is anyone who disagrees is eliminated. So the personal cost of getting out is very, very high. One can't underestimate the economics of this. I think also in the industrialized West, in Western Europe, the weakness in our economies has definitely played a contributing part to the growth of the black market. And the more you have the growth of the black market, the easier it is for organized crime and terrorist networks which converge to come together. So it sounds like a small detail, but everywhere I go on the continent now, you almost can't pay with a credit card. Oh, the credit card machine is broken. Now, why is the credit card machine broken? Because everybody <laughs> is facing a debt problem, right? The, nobody can afford to pay their taxes. So once you're operating in a cash economy, which I would argue much of Western Europe has started to become because of the economic backdrop, it just makes it easier to facilitate the growth of terrorist financing, terrorist groups. 
so again, I'm not saying there aren't cultural drivers. I'm not saying that religion doesn't play its part. I'm just saying that in the scheme of things, we should add into our analysis the economic drivers. And if we paid more attention to that, I think it might be easier. I'll give you one final example before I stop. Uh, I personally negotiated the anti-money laundering provisions of the Patriot Act. And I was fascinated as a former banker uh, that we put huge demands on the financial system to tell us where has the money come from. Know your customer. But if a terrorist organization wants to buy a million bucks worth of shampoo from Procter & Gamble and have it shipped to a subsidiary somewhere in, say, Latin America, where it is lost, and then it's sold out on the open market for 80 cents on the dollar, which frankly beats every margin you could come up with for illegal drugs or most of the things we usually talk about, that is a great <coughs> business. And is there any obligation on that part of the economy to record who bought the shampoo? No, nothing at all. So we clamp down on the financial sector and we leave all the doors wide open everywhere else. And I find this just fascinating that we don't even think about these things. So my part of this panel is simply to contribute. Let's bring the economic factors into the dialogue. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, the comprehensive approach. That's what's required. Uh, our final speaker is Sir Richard Sheriff. Uh, thank you. Um, can terrorism be defeated? <clears throat> I, I think uh, the answer to the question is, is no, because terrorism is a technique. It's a tactic of war. Uh, but we can defeat or neutralize those who use it as a tactic or technique of war. Um, and I think the essence of this in, 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 in principle is the, it's all about isolating the, uh, the irreconcilable element which perpetuates and uses terror from the moderate majority. It's what Mao called draining the swamp or draining the sea uh, in order to, to isolate. Um, I think there are two facts here, points to make. Number one, uh, this ultimately is, is all about, uh, it's about politics. It's got to be set in a political context. Um, so there has to be some form of political progress, or call it what you may. Uh, the second point, I think, is the paramount importance of <clears throat> the, the rule of law. Um, and in containing, therefore, I'd highlight those two facts of life. But terrorism can be contained through shared intelligence, through surveillance, uh, and through the application of the law to uh, lock up, uh, or if necessary, according to, depending on the rules of engagement, to strike and to kill or capture. I'd also make the point that it is also about the, as Robert said, the application of a comprehensive approach. That is that there is, it is the unit, it, it, it's finding and building the unity of purpose the unity of effort and, if necessary, the unity of understanding to bring together the multiple agencies that are going to have to be deployed in order to contain. But it's much easier, of course, if you can begin to build upstream security. Easier said than done. But I think this is something that needs to be thought through at the <coughs> international level because uh, building stability, in potentially in fragile or failing states allows the opportunity to begin to remove the soil in which terrorism flourishes. Uh, and this also requires a comprehensive approach. Yes, there is a role for security forces in capacity building and professionalizing armed forces and security, uh, security forces uh, in order to build state stability. Uh, but it requires administrative, building administrative capacity, removing, uh, tackling corruption, uh, a, a building law and order and governance. Uh, it requires the building up of education and health and all the aspects of, 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 of stability in order, as I say, to remove the, the, the soil in which terrorism flourishes. Uh, and of course, it's also about the battle of ideas in the specific, in the specific uh, context of Islamic terrorism and jihadism, 
as, as I think Robert uh, and Paddy have both said, it's about uh, allowing, supporting moderate Muslims to regain and, and uh, their own religion. And that's something I think we need to think through. Uh, but ultimately, of course, it's going to require international cooperation, internationally agreed strategies, regionally agreed strategies, uh, and support from, uh, from all mm -hmm. the countries affected by terrorism. The bottom line uh, uh, is, is that it's got to be done together, because whatever we do together, to quote uh, one of my fellow panellists, is going to be much, much better uh, than what we think we can do alone. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much, and thank you for being so succinct and raising such pithy matters. Um, in the end is our beginning, both uh, Richard and Paddy have raised the question of uh, politics and uh, politicians' role on the international stage or in the domestic agenda, and that has been alluded to by both uh, uh, um, Pippa and my speaker on my right. So I'm going to ask you... Lily. Lily. Sorry, the, 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 um, the first uh, point is, are we in danger of being too dogmatic about this? I'm just thinking in terms of practices and procedures, that in this country, of course, we have contest and the prevent strategy. Does this, is, does this risk being turned into dogma and does it rob you of the flexibility of approach? Uh, these are points for discussion among the panel um, now. I am very struck about your point that no child is born a terrorist, and then what happens? The issue there is who is the interlocutor? Who can break in? Who can break the cycle that leads to the indoctrination and radicalization. Because what I would add, Chairman's prerogative, is individual and ad hominem, or based on the individual uh, de-radicalization programs, look to me to be terribly expensive, both in human capital and, and, uh, and in money. I take your point, very well made. Um, look very clearly at the struggle that the Italians have had, but with some success in looking at mafia funding and going into assets. This is the thing, and it complements what Richard uh, was saying, that these things are many states actually not exactly the way uh, Croydon District Council is run, but the Islamic State is what it said on the, set, on the tin. It was a state with an economy, with funding. And at the higher end, um, the point that I would raise um, with um, Richard, yes, there is practice on the ground. Terrorists do want concrete things here on the kingdom of Earth as well as in another dimension and in another life. But ideologically, there is a tendency always to look for purity. This is the great thing in extreme revolutionary movements. And the great metaphor of my time was written by a very dear friend and colleague who died this year, Umberto Eco, in The Name of the Rose. The Name of the Rose, as you probably know, is a parable about the Red Brigades. And the Red Brigades were more Christian than Marxist, but, or, or, although they were both. This search for purity, this fanatical search for purity, breaking into the ideological cycle of the argument is, an, is another point. So, panel. First of all, do you think in terms of practices and procedures by sticking rigidly very often to a doctrine, a rubric, the thing that's set down by the Home Office, British practice, and you see it in other countries, does this really help us? Are we being flexible enough? Paddy? I think we're pushing at the... Well, first of all, I think I was rude to you all because um, <laughs> and, and, and that sort of cheerfully insulting way that I sometimes am, um, uh, this, because I asked you, I, I castigated you for not having studied the anarchists. Let me just say, the really shocking thing is that you guys haven't. That's, you know, what, why should you? The really shocking thing, if you gather, gathered every interior minister of Europe into this room and asked them if they'd ever heard of the anarchists, they too would shake their heads. And I suspect that if you gathered every police chief in Europe, a security chief in Europe into this room, they would probably, most of them would shake their heads too. I mean, just the, the ignorance of history, the failure of those who lead us to read books and above all to study what's gone on before is, I think, one of the most 
baleful aspects of our age and why we stumble from inadequate, um, inadequate um, policy to inadequate policy. Most of them have been either tried or we should have learned lessons from before. The second point I want to make is directly address Robert's issue here, um, which is that Robert uses the word, what was the word you used when you asked me? The, you said something about the, the narrative. Look, <clears throat> here is the, here's a central fact uh, that uh, I... Where the practice become, becomes dogma. You, dogma, you, dogma is the word you use. Yes, and exactly right, it, dogma. It's um, very, so it's a very fox is, word. Mm, <laughs> it is a very fox word, but a very good one. I'm going to change it because, a little bit, because, I mean, here is a fact which is rarely understood in politics, and above all, this is politics in the end, um, the battleground is language. Yeah. If you get your language right, then you can win. If you get your language wrong, then you're going to lose. And it's owning the terms and getting the right terms. And so the dogma is, and I've heard, I remember hearing Tony Blair say, we are fighting for Western values. No, we are not fighting for Western values. We are fighting for the universal values that sustain and underpin all the great religions and all the great philosophies and all the great civilizations. And the moment you say we are fighting for Western values, you reinforce ISIL's dogma, their Manichaean view of the world, that it's us and them. And you immediately exclude all of those who have contributed to Western values but don't happen to be Western. Yeah. I mean, Robert and I um, meet sometimes... Um, in, in the place called Pontignano, near Siena. And if you go to Siena Cathedral, forgive me for going on a bit, Robert, but I know you'll love this, because he's, a, <laughs> he's passionate about it, so he'll probably give me a bit of scope. If you go into Siena Cathedral, by the way, this is the cornerstone of the Renaissance, Siena Cathedral. Um, it was arguably one of the great buildings, built to half its, its, its planned size. On the floor, the great glory of Siena Cathedral is the pavimenti. Walk in there, and what do you see? Do you see in this cathedral the celebration of the lives of St. Francis or John the Baptist or our Lord? No. What you see there is Aristotle, Plato, Virgil, the great Hellenic philosophers. Why? Because we had just discovered at the end of the Dark Ages those wellspring of Hellenic principle and thought which are now the basis of Western values European values particularly, and where had we discovered them? In the universities of Baghdad and Samarkand, where they'd been preserved while we were slaughtering each other in a thousand years of blood. Um, and they'd been developed and they'd been incorporated into the Islamic religion. These are not our values, they're all our values. They're not our Western values, they're all our values. And unless you approach it from that end, and the business of language, you are not going to win this battle. My final point is this, that you know we ought to perhaps just regard the moat in our own eye. I suspect the number of uh, Muslims killed by in the name of our Christian God over the last thousand years is immeasurably greater than the number of Christian people who have been killed by Muslims in these last hundred years. Immeasurably greater. Immeasurably greater. And um, I also suspect, quite strongly, that, um, that if you, you don't have to go to the Muslim religion to hear preachers preaching death. I don't have to go to Baghdad to hear that. I can go to Belfast a few years ago. <laughs> we are all inflicted with this. It's the extremists we are tackling. And unless you know what your front line is, unless you know what the vital ground here, and the vital ground here is not bombs, it's not bullets, it's not repressive measures, it's language and values. Now, if we can combine together on that with our Muslim friends, then we have a chance, it seems to me, to win this battle. So I'd Thank like you. to pick on. up on, on one point that you <clears> make, <throat> which is uh, I actually have spent time looking at the anarchists, and I would say that what we're really witnessing is a wave of an anti-establishment sure. movement. Exactly. Now, you see it in the form of Brexit and Trump, yep, that's but right. it is also occurring in the form of as the Sykes-Picot Treaty borders disintegrate before our eyes, states are no longer in a position of control or trust, and you see the rise of non-state actors, uh, and it's effectively a challenge to the old establishment. Our modern anarchists today, and I'm now not gonna remember the name of the guy, but in Norway, uh, who went I'm after the prime minister. Um, I'm thank you. Uh, you know, if you look at the interviews with him, you can see that he's, what, he's, what his angst is about is that 
Robert. disaffectation from society, that sense of the establishment is not delivering what I expected or wanted. And this idea of the establishment is not delivering what I want, therefore I'm going to take another path. What it means is there's a likeness between anarchists versus terrorist organizations getting more oxygen. And again, instead of looking at each as individual, unique, specific cases, which we are good at doing, we can isolate the, the unique specifics of each of these, but it might serve us to begin to understand that when we live in times when people tend to feel that they can't trust in institutions, they don't trust in government, they have lost their faith in the establishment, that we get these kinds of outcomes. Isn't, isn't that an absolute, it's just such a fascinating and glorious thought. Here's the thought for you, that leaving aside the issue of violence, which of course yeah. separates ISIL, the fact is that Trump, Farage, and ISIL are all part of the same spectrum. What a lovely thought. Well, in a sense. And the spectrum is, is anti the establishment. It's the They're all part of the same thing. Yeah, but that's the let's, let's put this on the table before I come to Lily. Forgive me for having a senior moment and for, for forgetting <laughs> your, 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 but, and, and Richard. Um, the T word uh, that we've just had from, from Pippa. One of the things that strikes me when I've been teaching class recently and saying that you know, the, 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 the era of globalization was heralded by Francis Fukuyama as the end of history, <laughs> um, and indeed the other apocalyptic Manichaean view of the world was complemented with um, the clash of civilizations. What were the follow up? You'll start of a turn, Trivial Pursuit. What were the two follow up books of Francis Fukuyama and Samuel P. Huntington? They were Trust. <laughs> exactly. by Fukuyama, which is, in a way, a much more interesting book yeah. and really uh, gets to it, and if you have no trust. And the other one was, Who Are We? And Samuel P. was sure worried that the idea of the United States, the great federation of the states, was going to forget its foundation in the founding fathers, which he put down to the politics of Protestantism. Yes, he was very, very, um, very specific about it. But trust we have from Fukuyama and identity from, from, from Huntington, which we're really getting to some of the building blocks of what goes, what is behind this dislocation that we're seeing at the moment. And boy, you go to Mullenbeck, and I have several times, and you can see dislocation, uh, not only on Earth, but in Brussels. Richard, do you have an observation? I'm sure you do. Well, the, or, or, the, or three or four. The, 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 coming back to the, are we flexible enough? Um, I, I mean, we're good in parts, I think. I mean, mm. judge, judge it by the results. Mm. And um, thank God, uh, and I'm not taking anything for granted, and none of us should, we in this country appear to have been relatively successful uh, the agencies in countering. Now, can you explain that? Is it because of this thing that really does mean something of intelligence-led uh, uh, security and surveillance? I think it's a combination yeah. of the... There must, and you asked about contest, yeah. a counter-terrorist strategy. There yeah. must be an element of success in that. Yes. There must be an element of success in de-radicalization. There has yes. clearly been success in the law, and there has, must be success in intelligence and surveillance in order to prevent. And in integration. We've been the most successful country. This city is the most successful at integrating, and you can't uh, separate that. And I'm sure that's point. right. Whereas exactly. if you look across the channel, and yeah. I don't want in any way to... to but the, the, it's very but, interesting. But, but I think we do, need to, we, need, yeah. we, you know, we do need to, to compare and contrast. And so judge by results. But that does not mean to say that we must in any way be complacent. We must continue to find... And I think our strongest suit remains, uh, remains picking up Paddy's point, the values. It is the freedom of ideas which I think is, and, and, and which, which underpins our values, which I think gives us our, our strength. If there is one area that I think we need to be, perhaps, to look at, is, number one, it's, well, it's, it's, it's to be, it's not to take counsel of our fears and to be bold, particularly to be bold and to be ambitious internationally. Uh, and I think we have the means to do that through the various organizations who could do, I think, much, much more uh, to, to, uh, to get to the heart of this. Thank you very much. Lily, I want to, before I open it to the floor, I'm very struck by what you were saying um, about young minds and 
the narrative and the interior narrative that you get. How do you break the circle? Uh, how do you get interlocutors into uh, this world, which is a very enclosed world, and it's quite a, quite a terrifying world? Um, one of the interesting things that has emerged while, since IS has been under pressure, both in Iraq and Syria, is that the proselytizing <clears throat> uh, videos and messaging through social media has gone down measurably. The, the, this, this is from the security services. But what we don't know is how they get through the gate, because there is an intermediary stage, isn't it, that you can see the preacher, you can see the Awlakis, the Anand, the people like that, that were known and have now been taken out of the game. And I'm not really too sure about that, but we'll park that one for the moment. But how does it get translated? And it, because it's still being disseminated uh, through social media, people are still getting this message. And perhaps, you know, to just I, I say rather gloomily, because as we get more and more returnees uh, from the field of battle of, of, of jihad, in quotes, in, in the Levant, this problem will, 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 will probably increase rather than de decrease. How do you deal with this? Interlocutors and, 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 and the media that gets to the kid with the tablet in the bedsit or the bedroom. Mm. I, th I think it's an interesting question, who are the interlocutors? Because children grow up surrounded by thousands of different interlocutors and there may be only one voice that's speaking about extremism. I think we need to think about all <clears throat> of the messages that they're receiving. What are they learning? Who are they hearing from? Are they... I, I'm, I'm quite worried, and I don't, I don't know, we need to name it in the room, really. I'm quite worried that our... It's our establishment message, actually, right now in this country, not anti-establishment, but the establishment message is we need to teach British values to our children. The Prevent Strategy talks about British values. Now, UNICEF, we're in over 4,000 schools in the UK running a programme which talks about universal human child rights. Mm. And teachers and heads are coming to us and saying, can you help us? We don't know how to teach British values. Because what they've always done with us is talk to children and families and parents and communities, some of whom are quite transient in and out of their schools, come from all parts of the world, about that thing that connects all of them. And it makes it easier for them to talk about um, you know, why is FGM wrong or why should you not yeah. treat your classmate in this way when they're talking about a set of universal values and a convention on children's rights that have been ratified by all countries almost, with the exception of the United States of America, of course. So it's partly about the messages, <laughs> partly about the messages they're receiving. But I just want to say one other thing, which is um, I think it's important for us to remember that the other side of teaching British values is inadvertently you might have some British people feeling, perhaps there's something I ought to feel upset and angry about here. Why are my values under threat? Because that's the other message you give. Yeah. And we have as much actually to worry about in this country about the rise of far-right terror and not just worrying about yeah, Islamic yeah. terror. Mm. After all, it was one of our own very dearly beloved colleagues who was killed this year by mm -hmm. a member of the far right yeah. for yeah. espousing universal international values. Yeah. So let's, let's think about our, the unintended consequences of policies, rhetoric, language, as Paddy says, that creates all forms of division on both sides. I think a very useful tool to that, sorry to add to the reading list, is um, uh, Kwame Antiapia's uh, excellent wreath lectures which addresses this question of tribal identity, race, and universal values absolutely head on. I really, really commend it. I've really tortured you. Please can we have now your turn, uh, questions. And I'm sorry to say, I'm sure you have very interesting views, much more interesting than mine. But please don't give speeches. Um, if, if you want to make a statement and want us to reply, make it one line. You, sir, over there, nearest the microphone. And Thank could you. you identify yourself? Yeah, my name's DJ Peterson. I'm with Longview Global Advisors. And I want to pick up on this word moderation or moderates that you've used. And the world's going towards extremism, polarization, identity. And, and like we heard in the er earlier panel, remain. In, it's not exciting. It, moderation's not an exciting. It's not embracing universal values. Yeah, what's bland. the question, please? Sorry. So how do, you, how do you promote something that's bland and universal and peaceful <laughs> in a world that's all about polarization <clears throat> and identity and getting mad? Do you want to have a go? 
I write books, um, and um, by the way, my present ones in the in the, all the bookshops. <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, it's all game of spies. But uh, the net, and the book I'm writing is um, is about the German opposition to Hitler. So I'm deep into the 1930s, and I have to tell you that the parallels between the 1930s and our age are extraordinary and very very frightening. And Afterwards, after it was all over, when I say that the war was over, I, somebody asked Churchill, what was the answer? And by the way, the 1930s are absolutely full of this revolt against the establishment, denial of the, of the politicians, hate of the bankers, retreat to protectionism and away from multilateralism. And Churchill said in the classically Churchill way, well, how did you do it? And he said, we just kept on buggering on, he said. Mm. And that's what we have to do. I mean, the 1930s was full of, you know, democracy has failed. We have to invent a new way of doing it. We have to abandon those democratic values and choose strong leaders. Horrible parallels. The truth is that in the end, let me just make this very blunt point to you, which you may find a bit shocking, but it is true. There is no great civilization no great government, no time of peace, no successful administration anywhere in the world that has not been built on those fundamental va human rights values that I go back to those great um, Hellenic texts. None. There isn't a single one of them that has done that over time. So we have to win by just keeping on buggering on, not losing face, continuing to assert the importance of that centre moderate ground. It is true, I don't want to get into politics too much, but it is true in Britain, as elsewhere, we've now migrated to the extremes. The centre is left voiceless, shattered and broken. And the greatest danger, the thing where we lost in the 1930s, was the centre, the progressive, decent centre, given to the habit of moderation and of tolerance and respect, never got its act together. And that is the biggest danger to us now. If we don't get our act together in favor of those values, we will see a time of terrible turbulence and violence in which we'll have to win that space all over again. God knows, God help us, maybe even with the shedding of even more blood. I hope not. So that's the importance of it. Keep on buggering on. To, to, so. to just quickly address your point, I come back mm. to economics again to say that when the world economy is growing, we tend to have some... Uh, centripetal forces that pull us together, centrifugal forces that pull us together, uh, that bind us together because basically everybody's better off. And so you don't have this move towards extremism. When the world economy starts to weaken, mm. you get the opposite. And th there's no reason why the movement of power from the center back to local communities has to mean that this is in a bad direction. Local communities can be highly empowered and infused with the universal values that yep. you guys are describing. But that is our task before us. I don't think we can stop that movement of power from the center to the local. Oh, okay. But it doesn't necessarily have to reinforce Absolutely. terrorism. Absolutely. Robert, can I just... Yeah, go, go quickly, Richard, and I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm indicating uh, the uh, gentleman there, and then there's somebody behind... Oh, yeah. sorry. There's a, there's a lady... I'll take the gentleman first. So, Richard, do you want something to say? Yeah, I think it is, it is the, the to, to reinforce the point. I mean, we, we, it's, about, it's about continuing to support, empower um, what I believe is still there. Those who shout most loudly may not represent the moderates, but the moderates may be the quiet majority who want to get on with their lives. Yeah, exactly. And here, I think, the well, absolutely backing up Pippa's point, um, this is where I think capitalism has a part to play. Adam Smith type capitalism that says capitalism is to generate prosperity for the majority. Uh, and, I, and we haven't heard much about the, the private sector getting engaged in this business because actually it's very much in the interests of the private sector, I think, to particularly to continue to support or to contribute to the support of uh, unstable regimes, fragile states, in order to generate the prosperity from which stability and ultimately security can flow. Sir. Rupert Phelps, General Richard, regarding your point on international cooperation, if our parliament repeals the Single European Act of 1972, may that make information and intelligence sharing between our agencies and those in Europe more difficult in this battle? It's the European Communities Act, actually. Yeah, uh, I mean, the answer is, I, yeah. 
Do you want to take that yet now? No, go quickly. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I, uh, I am absolutely sure that, uh, I hope I'm sure, that our agencies will be looking at how to continue the close cooperation which exists at the moment, which is going to be essential uh, if, if we are to contain and ultimately defeat the, the challenge we face. Could I also say, the Five Eyes program, yeah. which the United States mm. runs, which is the most significant intelligence sharing program in the world, you know, we're sharing intelligence with the British if we don't have the European Communities Act. Yeah, you do have a long history of doing so. So, well, I'm just saying it, that it, it, one legal construct is not the it, answer. Uh, there are many ways no, that you can share That is the right answer. Um, and and we if, if we wish to make it so, we can make it so, but it isn't inevitably so when we leave. It's up to the will of the government. Can I take mm. you, ma'am? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed the history lesson. Very sorry, who much. are you? Uh, sorry, Joan Howey from The Economist Group, editor of the Democracy Index and part yeah, of the yeah, sure. team. Um, enjoyed yeah, the, sorry, thank the, you. The, the thank you. <laughs> the history uh, lesson, but shouldn't we be thinking about what is historically specific and contemporary and actually very postmodern um, about this nihilistic um, uh, IS, homegrown terrorist phenomenon uh, that we have? And is it not in many ways an extreme manifestation of contemporary identity politics, the desire to yeah. seek victimhood. It's actually a product of the degeneration or a reaction against universal values and the promotion of multiculturalism, relativism, and so on. We do not teach British values in our schools. On citizenship uh, GCSE courses in, in our schools, we, we teach multiculturalism, identity politics. My kids go to these schools and do these courses. We don't teach what it means to be mm -hmm. a citizen, to mm -hmm. uphold genuinely universal values. You'd mm -hmm. be better off teaching them about ancient Greece uh, philosophy or something like that, no. not what they're taught today. Uh, uh, just on this, I was recently speaking with one of the potential presidential candidates in Libya, and I asked him, explain to me what is driving ISIS. And he said one way to think about it is it's like Italian-style fascism under Mussolini. Yeah. It's not German-style fascism under Hitler, which was very much about the state imposing. Mm -hmm. This is more about subjugation of the individual to a larger philosophical view. And what's <clears throat> important there, to your point, is that uh, we have seen this before, and that sense of nihilism is not something that's brand new to Patty's point. Uh, and we should perhaps step back and think about the philosophical roots of, uh, of these phenomena. And as you say, it's not just the anarchists. Maybe we see similarities here with the fascist mo movements of the 1940s as well. Yeah. Can I have another question, please? Because, um, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry, Phil Allison from KCG. Uh, my question is: Is how, how much do you think the rate of change of social of uh, that social media empowers in the current world changes this crisis from history? Because I understand the recollections with history, but it feels to me that the acceleration of things like migration processes and so mm. by the rapidity with which information can flow might be, climate, might yeah, be changing. Yeah, absolutely. The answer is yes. Um, and um, <laughs> yes. can I, no, we'll answer your question, but could I take another question? Yes, right in the mid distance, yes. So, Flight Attendant Jane Pickers Gill, Royal Air Force. Um, my question is how can we promote international universal values on the international stage when this time last year in the UN it took some extremely creative legislation to be able to bypass the veto from Russia and China? and fight terrorism in Syria. How do we reconcile those two? Let's take those two. We are almost, and we're into our last six minutes. Um, first of all, yes, um, history is not inevitable, I think, is, is the question. And I think that there has been such quantitative and qualitative change. How do you notice that? I mean, even, when, even when we talk about romantic terrorism, national liberation terrorism, using the Rappaport four waves. 
we're in a completely different era in street, it, 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 it strikes me, um, particularly when you look at the changes of populations across the world, not least in the Middle East. But mm. would you like to meet these? Uh, to, to well, I agree. Budget? The answer to your question is yes. And speed of change is affecting every realm of endeavor at the moment. But maybe the more specific issue is that in the defense community, and we'll see, Sir Richard, whether you agree with me on this, traditionally, I think throughout history, the cost of defense is always a multiple of the cost of offense. And so technology always empowers the smaller player that comes up with, a more, with an interesting technological edge against the traditional larger entity, usually the state. And so we're just seeing a continuation of that process. And the language of social media is one piece of that puzzle. Uh, the miniaturization of weapons is another aspect of it. But again, that's a, throughout history, that's been true. Yeah, and I think there's a, it's about contesting the space. And I think you're absolutely right that the, the pace of change, the space has, has changed. The battleground has changed as a result of the, you, know, you mentioned social media, the globali globalization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, Im that imposes, and goes, it also goes back to the, the how, how flexible are we flexible enough? Well, unless we can, we, in terms of the agencies and the organizations and the states looking to uh, face up to this challenge, are able to contest the space in, in, the, in the new space as well, we're not going to be flexible enough. Um, picking up the, the point about the international organizations, and I, I think here it's about... Um, I mean, we, we have to remember that it, no, no international organization, less possibly the EU, is a, is a supranational organization. It is, it is rather like NATO, okay. made up of the nations that make, it is the nations, it is the members that make it up. Uh, so uh, if, 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 if the international organizations are not right, it's up to us at, in concert with our international partners to make them right uh, and reform, however difficult, is something we should never lose sight of. Okay, now we re really are coming to the end. Aria Ponce. Uh, well, Joan written. said that, um, but this was all postmodern. I suspect the anarchists looked terribly postmodern in their time. Um, this is all terribly nihilistic. They were precisely encouraging nihilism. Uh, look, I'm not saying history, knowing history absolves you from tackling some of the key issues, not least of which is your identity. Read Rupert Smith's book, The uh, Utility of Force, and you realize that this is going to be a battle about public opinion and capturing the minds. And you, but, but having a model uh, is, a, is a right way to approach it, and history gives you that. And by the way, the rate of change point, I don't think the 19th century looked anything less uh, a, a, a pace of unstoppable, unbelievable change. By the way, what they were voted against then, look at Parliament, look at the riots in Parliament Square, it was not globalization, it was trains. Trains brought strangers to your community and robbed jobs. And that caused the whole dislocation that caused the anarchists to come about. I don't think this is, relatively speaking, any faster pace of change than we've had before. It comes back to winning the battle for public opinion. Last point is the flight lieutenant's point. Look, we have been obsessed since shock and awe with the idea that the single instrument for the winning of battles across the world is high explosive. We've mm. forgotten, we've forgotten um, the great, um, the great uh, oh God, um, um, we've forgotten the idea that, who was it, um, the German uh, von Clausewitz, who said that war is the continuation of politics by other means. He meant diplomacy. We remember the war, we forget the diplomacy. Policy. We have failed to encase war within a, f a framework of diplomacy, and that's why we lost in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, and now in Syria. We have to learn the habit of building diplomatic coalitions as well as using high explosive, and that's the answer to the we question. Have to cut Lily, I must give you... Sorry? You haven't been able to get a word in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to Quickly. it. Quickly, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I agree. I agree. It's hearts and minds. Uh, we Hearts and minds are formed and grown in childhood. Uh, the human principles haven't changed at all throughout history. It's about identity, belonging, having a stake in a society. What's changed is the tools and the methods of communicating, learning and absorbing messages from the world. So we do need to change how we tackle things and understand that children live uh, online. They live in a place where if we don't go there and play with them and in, in and and communicate with them there. We won't ever understand uh, how their hearts and minds are being formed. I've got a 16-year-old son. He has been in the dark web. It's not a place I ever want to go, but we have to go there to 
help children develop into the kind of citizens we want. Right. Um, thank you very much. I thought we were going to get to the dark web. This is the other bit <laughs> and the media. <laughs> what people like me should or should not be doing. Terrorism is what it says. It is an ism. It is a means and a way. It's not an end in itself. And just to conclude, we always need to address and be able to change our minds to address it in each context. The question raised by Louise uh, uh, Richardson in her book, What Terrorists Want. They always want something on heaven on earth. It is up to us to have the moral and intellectual courage, as well as the physical courage, to address that question. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.